Thank God that was a dream or a nightmare. I don't know which one you want to call that. So we are appreciating our volunteers today, and I'm, I'm about to preach a message as well with our Church According to Jesus series. But I just want to give one more story of, of just an incredible act of love that one of our volunteers did. I should say a, a couple young volunteers. Um, I got permission, or we got permission from Marisol Jordan to share this story. But Marisol and your daughters, do you mind raising your hands real quick or just waving at us? I know that's awkward to do, but yeah. Right down here in the front, they, they help greet the doors in the back near the kids' playground. And uh, one day, uh, Mrs. Millie came in and uh, she needed prayer and her, her knee and her leg wasn't feeling too well, if I'm not mistaken, her knee wasn't feeling well. And uh, they were gonna pray for her and mom got pulled away by another task real quick. And uh, what happened was they turned her, or she turned around and saw her daughters praying for Miss Millie. Now, your daughters are no older than 10, right? Yep, so uh, 10 and what? Three, eight, and 10. Wow, praise God. So you have these, these girls praying for Miss Millie, but this is what's beautiful. So Miss Millie is getting prayed over by these little children at the door. And she walks over here and she tells Dorothy this story. And she says, Dorothy, my knee doesn't hurt anymore. My knee doesn't hurt anymore. And so, wow, praise God. So cool. Thank you. Thank you for serving, both of you that are here right now. Appreciate you doing that. It doesn't, doesn't matter how old we are, does it? It's pretty cool. So thank you for doing that. And you just never know divine appointments like that that God is going to um, bring here in his house or even outside the church as we move by the Spirit. So that's such a cool story. And also, before I pray for this message, I just want to give you guys an announcement as well that last week you gave over $5,000 towards our Dream Fund. And we just want to say thank you so much. What a, an amazing act of love. So cool. Praise God. And if, if you want, you can actually drive by or even kind of peek into our our garage out there where the food pantry works, they've already started construction this week, so it's pretty exciting. They've already begun to gut out the middle to make more room. So if you want to look at that corner of the parking lot, you can see the results of, of the investment and the time that's going into that. So we're really excited about that. Why don't we pray? God, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this room already and in our hearts. And Lord, we are searching your word and we're searching you and your son Jesus to be more like him and to be a church according to Jesus, a church that Jesus started. And God, we need your help on this because we're human and we don't have it all figured out. So we humble ourselves, God, and we ask for you to, to shape and mold us into the image of your son and likeness of your son Jesus. Thank you, God, that the church is mobile. Thank you, God, that you send us out in power outside these walls. Thank you for filling us up today, too. And I pray you would move in ways that even I haven't planned because it's according to your plan. We submit ourselves to the word today. We submit ourselves to this message. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So church according to Jesus, Jesus focused on making or forming a disciple-making church. And we've covered so far that in this church, the cultures and practices are reaching or to reach, to connect. And today I want to hit grow. And then next week we're going to hit empower. I'm excited about that one. And then lastly is going or go. And so today we're talking about growing and it's really important. This step is so important on making disciples. And if you're in this room today, there's two things that's for sure, according to Jesus and according to the word, that you need to grow and I need to grow. And the second thing is, is that the people that we're loving, that we're reaching, and that we're connecting to God and to the body of Christ, they need to grow. And so today I'm, I'm giving this, this message. I'm, I'm saying it's really an equipping message for all of us, but it may be very revealing for us as well as followers of Christ who are trying to grow aware I need to grow. And this is so important. It's such an important topic because um, the, the, the theme of growing, it permeates through the entire Bible, that there's always improvement or growth. 
And I want to show you just Jesus' growth strategy as well. But before I jump into that, um, let's talk about that decision, that moment where someone gives their life to Jesus Christ. Because we haven't hit that yet. And, uh, and it really can happen in so many different ways. At Calvary, we could be doing outreaches and someone is just moved by the presence of God and realizes that they need Jesus and they'll give their life to Christ. For some people, they'll start getting connected to church or getting connected to your community group or just getting connected to you through coffee or something. And they'll say, I need to give my life to Jesus. I recognize I need Jesus. That's actually what happened to me. I got a random message on Facebook from a young lady, my wife and I both. And she said, I, I want to get baptized. And so when I heard her say that, I said, well, I, I need to find out, you know, where she is with Jesus. Because to be baptized, water baptized, you need to be saved, right? You need to have a relationship with Jesus Christ because that's what it's all about. And so I started this conversation with her. And the next day she's in my office. I told you guys this already. And she had already believed in Jesus. She already believed in God. But you know what we did together? We took time to confirm her relationship with Jesus. We took time to pray together, and she asked Jesus to change her life, and she said that she would follow him. And so we went through Romans 10, 9 through 10. You can write that in your notes right now if you want. Romans 10, 9 through 10, where she confessed Jesus as her Lord and Savior and believed that he rose again, and she will be saved is what we pretty much said. And then... Uh, I asked her, would you, like for, would you like to pray that? Would you like to say this from your own mouth? Or would you like my help? And she wanted my help. And so I led the prayer and she repeated after me. Either way, it was genuine. Either way, it was a genuine conversion. So we had this beautiful moment where someone gives her life to Christ, where this, this young lady gives her life to Christ. And she needs to grow. And so... Here's the situation. You might have someone who's already given their life to Christ and they come into your life. They've already believed in Jesus as their Lord and Savior and, and they don't know what to do next. And so that's a huge part of the disciple making process and that's why this message today is so important. What did Jesus do and what can we do to help these new believers or someone who gives their life to Christ to grow? And no matter what, whether you're a new believer or you've been in been a believer for a long time and you're making disciples, don't we all just need to continue to grow? We all continue to grow. Here is Jesus' growth strategy. Jesus uh, transformed and grew people, and it was a fundam fundamental experience to the church that Jesus started. When Jesus said, follow me, it meant that the disciples had to actually unfollow things. That when you follow Jesus, you actually have to unfollow some things in your life. Another word for that could be repentance. To turn away from and turn towards God is what repentance means. And so right away, if you, if you say, I'm following Jesus, then you have to, in a way, really unfollow yourself. And I actually wrote this down here that uh, from Matthew 16, 24, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Wow, that is not an easy task, is it? Jesus did not play around. Right away, he's like, deny yourself. Whew. Then take up your cross meant to take up the identity to be willing to suffer with me. I mean, this is, that's heavy stuff to say to some people who are new to the faith. But he was saying, surrender yourself, surrender your life, and take up a new way of life and follow me. In order to be more like Jesus, we have to be less of ourselves. And that is not something that we like to hear nowadays in our world, is it? <laughs> we live in a very meistic society. Society, we see, you know, the you magazines, me magazines. Is there an I magazine yet? There's iPhone. I mean, to, to, to surrender to Jesus is to submit to him in his ways and thinking. To believe in Jesus means to no longer believe in yourself, but to believe in Jesus' ways. That alone is a paradigm shift for anyone. 
And so to be called into the family of God and to be drawn in and to believe in Jesus meant immediately to surrender and to begin to be transformed. So it was a natural process that you were going to be transformed and that you were going to grow into becoming more like Jesus. What I love about Jesus' growth strategy, secondly, is he was willing to grow and mature his disciples by doing life with them. That's why we described the connect step last week. Jesus didn't say, all right, I need you to do these things and I'll see you later. No, he invited them into his life to show, to show them what he meant by being transformed and grow. Matthew 28, 19 through 20 has been an anchor scripture for us. And the one line I want to bring out today is, is it says this, teaching these new disciples to obey all that I have commanded you. We, again, I'm going to say this again, we have to be with people enough to teach them, right? We can't do a conference. We can't do a one-day session. It's not how people grow. They grow through life experiences and ongoing connection and teaching. And what's incredible, though, the difference with Jesus and other rabbis, which I think is amazing, is Jesus was able to transform the heart of man so that their actions could change. No other rabbi in the Bible, no other leading priest of that time or teacher was able to alter your heart and then you start behaving a certain way. Only Jesus has the power to do that. Hence the reason why we need to help people have that relationship with Jesus first to have that moment where they believe in Jesus, they surrender themselves and come into a relationship with him, he comes into their lives, that his spirit comes into them. You know what that's called? That's being born again. That's what John 3 talks about when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. He said, you must be born of the spirit. And so he had to be reborn. And Nicodemus is confused. He's like, what does that mean? I have to go back to my mother's womb? That's strange. No, he, Jesus was saying, no, you have to be born of the Spirit now because the Spirit of God's going to be in you and the Spirit of God's going to help you live the Christ life. And so the reality is, is, is we, can, we can bring someone into the family of God and, and we could try to help them live the Christ life, but without Christ in them, how can they? Do we understand that? If not, we're just kind of going through the motions and we're kind of showing up to church or we're showing up to Bible study and nothing's clicking, nothing's resonating. And so Jesus really was purposeful at making sure they believe in him first. And you can read about this in John 1 through 3. To believe in him and be saved was to have a new heart. And then their actions would begin to change. But Jesus didn't just like let them grow accidentally. He actually did the next step, too. He made sure he, they were okay. He made sure they believed. And then Jesus intentionally taught a variety of topics to help them grow in what was already taking place in their life. In other words, their heart changed. Now they needed to know, like, the details. They needed to know how to live this new heart and new life. Does that make sense? And so he would go through a variety of topics, and Jesus taught on the attitude in the heart of man. He went through the Beatitudes of Matthew 5. He went all the way through, through Matthew 7, and he was teaching them. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And, it, and scholars are actually convinced that Jesus wasn't just teaching crowds. He was literally trying to teach his disciples. He's like, you believe in me, so here's how my people live. Here's how we live. And I just want you to have a, a manual, a playbook on how to live. He covered the kingdom of God. He covered having a pure heart how to live and love with others, how to serve, how to believe for healings, how to pray, how to find eternal life. You can read all this in the Gospels. How do you forgive? How should we look at this world? How should we view money and materialism? How do we give? How do we worship and obey? And, and really the list goes on. If you go through the life of Jesus and you read the Gospels, Jesus does the one more thing, and it's the last part here. Jesus uh, puts the disciples in situations where they would grow. Can you imagine being Peter? I, why would Peter ask this question to Jesus? 
if you want me to come out there on that water, you know, ask me to come out there. There, Jesus is on the water. If that's you, ask me to come out there, Jesus. (laughs) And Peter literally begins to walk on water. What a test of faith and a miracle, right? A sign, a miracle. What about the time where where Jesus puts the disciples in a situation where they go to, to a Samaritan village and a Samaritan woman is by the well and they leave to go get food and when they come back, Jesus is talking to a woman in public which is unheard of. Then she's a Samaritan which Jews and Samaritans couldn't stand each other and to make matters worse, she was a prostitute in that hometown. Or she had, she had some issues with consistent marriages, so to say. And they come into this situation, they're like, whoa, who is he talking to? Do you think that maybe Jesus was trying to teach them how to break down some walls that they've learned culturally? And that he was trying to teach them how to love people? Yeah. One of the models that Jesus actually has, and this might encourage you today, is Jesus actually did the model of do and teach, not teach and then do. So in other words, Jesus didn't wait for them to be qualified. He qualified them through the experiences. So they would begin to follow Jesus, and then they would begin to learn. So they would follow him to situations into areas where they had to be strengthened and tested and grow. I think of one where they were up on the mountain praying or they were away praying, and when they came down, 5,000 people are hungry looking for food, and Jesus is like, you guys feed them. You disciples, you should feed them. And they're like, I don't know what to do. We don't have that kind of money to feed all these people. By the way, 5,000 men doesn't mean their families and kids, so it was was estimated around 15,000 people We're down at the bottom of this mountain, ready to be fed and hungry and be taught. Jesus wanted to teach them. And so Jesus used that moment to test their faith to see what they would do. They failed, like all of us probably would have, right? I don't know what to do, Jesus. I I only have so much in a bank account. And then a little boy steps forward with a little basket, right? Five loaves of bread, two fish. And Jesus multiplies it. So Jesus put them through situations. You know why I think that's encouraging? Is I think a lot of times we wait until we're like at a certain level to start serving and reaching people. If we wait, we would, we would just have to go ahead and die to wait for that. Because are we ever really perfect enough in this world? I mean, can we, yeah, can we have some standards that we are living? Absolutely. You know what one of the standards is? Is living by example. Yeah, we can get there, but you can't live by an example if you don't start living the example. So that's what Jesus was trying to say is, follow me and do these things, and while we're doing them, I'll teach you. You know, we all know what that is, on-the-job training. So be encouraged today. If you plan to grow, if you plan to be more like Jesus, start following him and then doing what he says and he will help you do it. It's time to grow. This is a double entendre on your outline because it's time to grow and then people need time to grow, right? And I wanna get into some practical ways that you can grow and that we can help others grow. And I just have to say right now, I praise God that my little children grew up because I couldn't handle another diaper, (laughs) ever. I mean, the day that we were done with diapers, pretty sure I did a Holy Ghost dance in my house. (laughs) It was awesome. Um, Anyone know about diaper genies? Those tube cylinder thingies that you throw diapers in and they have like the blue bags and stuff and, you, and it just helps your house not stink <laughs> really bad. Well, uh, <laughs> I guess I had this like, you know, idea that maybe I could see how much I can stuff in there, <laughs> you know. And uh, one time I, uh, I went to go grab it and it just wouldn't open anymore. It was so packed. And uh, 
So I had to take the lid off and they just fell out everywhere. And so I had to put them back in the bag. And then I tied the bag because I almost threw up smelling everything. And, um, and as I stretch it out, I kid you not, this bag, now this, the, the thing, the container is only really that high. But for somehow, I was able to get a bag from like my foot to the corner of that stage full of diapers in there um, because I was just trying to save money because those things are expensive. Um, and then I was also lazy and didn't want to take it out every week. And I just, I just want to say thank you, God, for growth and natural growth <laughs> of, of babies. Um, any parents in here want to say amen to that? I mean, you remember? Yeah. I say that because naturally, you know, God willing, we grow, right? We naturally grow. It's the same thing spiritually. We, once, we are, once, once kids are born, they just start to grow, right? And, and same thing when it comes to spirituality. When, when we give our life to Christ, the plan is growth. It's not backwards. It's forwards. And it's the same thing spiritually. And I, bring, I use this analogy because of our next scripture, 1 Peter 2, 1 through 3. It says this. And the first line seems really harsh at first, but it's, it's not there by accident. Peter's being honest here, and he's, he's actually connecting this to the scripture clearly. Get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and all unkind speech. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you have had a taste of the Lord's kindness, referring to his salvation and how he loves us. Now, could you imagine me going to my son Connor or my daughter Ava and giving her a piece of steak in the crib? That would be dangerous. We don't do that. Spiritually, we wouldn't try to understand everything about the Word of God in one day. But here's the thing. My kids were helpless. I mean, my, 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 I, I struggled to sleep the first three months because if I didn't hear them breathing in the bassinet next to the bed, I was like, what's going on? You know, are you okay? Yeah, yeah okay, yeah, they're good, they're good. You know, you know what I mean? Like, there's a natural fear there, right? That something's wrong with your kid. And my wife, she was just out. My wife didn't care. <laughs> no, no, she did, she did. She cared. Yeah, it was exhaustion, all right. I probably, look, I look like a zombie the first six months. My wife, she was beautiful. She's always beautiful. Um, she looked a certain way, but she's beautiful. But I just think about the, the helplessness and the vulnerability of a newborn baby and how much help they need. And, and we too, as new believers, we need as much help as we can get. And, and listen, if you have a friend who gives his or her life to Jesus, they need as much help as you can get. They're so vulnerable, they're so fragile at that moment. I mean, they need help to be fed. Spiritually. No Christian can stay the way he is because Jesus is progressive. Jesus doesn't come in and bring death. He brings life. He brings growth. And so naturally, a, a, a newborn believer should grow. And, and the basic journey for a new believer, Peter wasn't playing around. He was saying the basic spiritual milk is to turn away from evil behavior, but then take on the word of God and the truth of God. That's what he's trying to say here. Spiritual milk is the basic instruction of God's word. So one of the first steps for a new believer is to walk in the new life of repentance, turning away from and then turning to God and God's truth and basic instructions is right in here. But here's the thing. Do you, any of you remember the first time you picked up a Bible and didn't know what in the world to do with it? I mean, you get lost. I thank God my dad pointed me to the book of John and then Romans after John because that was, Romans was heavy. But when I started reading it as a teenager, it started making sense. And, and God spoke to me through the book of Romans. He spoke to me through the book of John. But notice that my dad, my dad helped point me in the right direction as a parent. And so we're going to become spiritual parents to these new believers and help point them in the right direction and say, have you looked at the book of John yet? Can I, and then it gets better. You can also do it with them. 
What's interesting to note about this scripture that we have here is the context of this scripture is Peter was writing to a church that was going through severe persecution. Like, I'm thinking that Peter's going to give them all this advice on how to handle persecution. If you, have you read the letters of First and Second Peter recently? He talks about spiritual growth all the time. You know what I think about that? That means that in order for us to handle what's coming, or in order for us to handle the attacks of the enemy, we need to grow spiritually. And so he's not even counting that out. He, he's not like, okay, get your arms up, you know, get, get ready to fight, you know, let's, let's sharpen our swords. No, he's like, get on your knees. Let's grow. Let's get deeper. Let's understand what Jesus has done for us and even love people. It's, it's beautiful. So even in the midst of persecution, growing spiritually is important. And then let's look at what the new believers did in the book of Acts. I'm going to keep moving here to show you what takes place when you first get saved. Acts 2, 42, it's on the screen for you. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. This is when the church exploded. They had, there were salvations, there was Around 3,000 people gave their life to Christ after Peter's message to them. And so now, what's the first thing they do? They form a community, like Connect. They've been reached. They connect in a community, and now they start growing. Isn't that awesome? I mean, it's laid out in Scripture how we need to be disciple makers and make disciples and how we need to grow. They devoted. That's a key word. They devoted. How many little children eat milk once a week, they would die, right? I wish my son would have quit crying about eating at three in the morning, but he didn't. And then five, and then seven. <laughs> and then I watched them for the first couple months, so nine, 11. I was like, man, this kid can eat. They need, he needed food. And in other things, that was gross. <laughs> he was devoted to getting food, and I had to be devoted to my son, and they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. In other words, they were getting sermons. They were, getting, they were in Bible study, and then they were in fellowship. They had the fellowship of the body of Christ around them, and then they were breaking bread and having communion together. You know what that is? I call that worship. They were remembering what Jesus did. They were obeying God and worshiping him because Jesus said, take this communion in remembrance of me. And then they were praying together. So here's the basic needs and process for new believers. So if you've been wondering, what do I do with a new believer or where should I start as a new believer? It's right here in front of us. But let me go even deeper about growing a new believer, the immediate needs of a new believer. This is so important. New believers need spiritual community. And I know we talked about that last week, but let me give you a reason why. Because to believe in Jesus can be very lonely. I mean, I was, I was talking to someone recently. He gave his life to Christ, and immediately he realized that everyone he had fun with and hung out with, he could no longer do that. Because everything they did was exactly what P, uh, Peter said to get rid of in your life. And so overnight, he's like, he's found eternity. He's found meaning and he's found everything. He's found Jesus. And the next thing he's lost all his friends. <clears throat> Isn't that real? I mean, I, I had some lonely nights growing up as a teenager because some of my friends decided to go down different paths. And, I, and, I, and I, I stood my ground and said, I'm not going to do it. I wasn't perfect. I had my own mistakes. But I stood my ground and said, I'm not going down those paths. 1 Peter 4, 1 through 5. Write that down in your outline. God gave me this this morning, actually. 1 Peter 4, 1 through 5. <clears throat> since then, since Christ suffered physical pain... You must arm yourselves with the same attitude he had and be ready to suffer too. And I'll connect that to be ready to be lonely too. Do you think Jesus felt lonely on the cross? Absolutely. 
but he did have God. He cried out to God, didn't he? For if you have suffered physically for Christ, you have finished with sin. That is, wow, that's a sermon in itself. If you suffer for me, that means that you're willing to resist anything for me. That means you love me more than sin. Wow. You won't spend the rest of your lives chasing your own desires. Remember, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. But you will be anxious to do the will of God. That's a healthy anxious, eager. You have had enough in the past of the evil things that godless people enjoy, their immorality and lust, their feasting and drunkenness and wild parties, and their terrible worship of idols. That's the sneaky one. Things that people put above God. Of course, your former friends, listen to this line, of course, your former friends are surprised when you no longer plunge into the flood of wild and destructive things they do, so they slander you. I mean, it says here, your former friends, that's key, and now they're slandering you because now you follow Jesus. Has anyone experienced that before? Because I have. But remember that they will have to face God who stands ready to judge everyone, both the living and the dead. So in other words, he's saying, look, do not feel the pressure of your friends. Do not feel the pressure of this persecution. It's interesting. We look at persecution as like Rome coming and killing them, but he's actually addressing that perse persecution could be that they're now going to leave you alone and they're going to slander you in the same time. I think about the people who come to Christ in prison. They always say it. They say it all the time. They were there for me on the streets. They were there for me in my life. And as soon as I go to prison, they never show up. You find out who your true friends are, don't you? And so Peter was like, don't, don't be surprised when because you follow Jesus, now all your friends are slandering you because they're not saved. They're not, they don't see it. And so I'm, I'm here to encourage you as a new believer that if you're alone, you're not alone. There's a difference between being lonely and aloneness with God. Get alone with God and you will feel God's presence and then get involved in a community. And that's why we as disciple makers have to bring people into our groups, into our lives, and help them. Because when they're new, they're vulnerable. They're lonely. They're hurting. They're not sure what to do next. Am I speaking truth here? Yeah. I mean, that, this is what I've run into all the time as I've been making disciples. And so right away, my heart breaks for them, and I bring them in. The second thing they need besides community is they need grace and availability. New believers don't know a lot. New believers may still post some inappropriate things that they shouldn't post. They may say some inappropriate things they shouldn't say. And, and they may think some things that you shouldn't think. And so they need a little grace and they need a little availability so you can kind of coach them to go down that path where, hey, you know, <laughs> hey, brother, you know, what would Jesus want you to do? I mean, if Jesus says, if Jesus talks about how lusting can cause you to sin and in your heart even commit adultery, should we probably, should we, should we talk about that stuff? Because you, you said you followed Jesus, and I, I love you, man, and I'm here for you. And by the way, that's a very delicate conversation, isn't it? But don't, don't people need that? Little steering and guiding? I'm not. They need that. And, uh, and we love them that much that we're willing to do that, right? I mean, think about, are we, do we love people enough to help them with that? Yes. I need to keep moving. Uh, new believers need the teaching and guidance of biblical truth. I want to show you this chart I put together to help us. It's not all inclusive of everything. And you're going to be able to get this online. Write, write this down, calvarydover.org. CalvaryDover.org backslash resources. CalvaryDover.org backslash resources. Uh, by the way, when it comes to the grace and availability, you know, new believers need time to foster that fellowship with God through Bible time and reading. And so our availability 
to be with them and help them study the Bible and pray with them is so important. It's so important. So that's what I'm trying to get to on that. So check this out. These are areas that I've been helping disciple people in. And you may have to start at forgiveness. You may have to start at God's love. You may have to start at their, if they're saved now, you know, check out their new identity in Christ. I've given you a bunch of scriptures that can help you in your Bible study time with these new believers. Isn't that cool? And it works. And that's only a few. I mean, there's so many scriptures, but these are great starts. When you read God's love in Luke 15 about the prodigal son, it's hard not to be moved and be, and be sure of God's love for you. Why is this important? These are foundational things about Christ and his love for us and our new identity in Christ. And so new believers need the teaching and guidance of biblical truth. And so here's a little cheat sheet for you. Sound good? So that will be on our website tomorrow. We had some issues of getting things printed this weekend for this, for this day. New believers are becoming disciple makers too. So lastly, so we, they need help to know how to make disciples. So they're watching you and doing that with you. I'm going to breeze over that because I want to get to this next part. Disciple makers, um, there's a challenge for us as the church and to be disciple makers. You ready? And this is something that I had to come to grips with. That I can only help people grow as much as I grow. And that I can't help people follow Jesus if I'm not following Jesus. And so it's so vital that we as believers are being discipled by Jesus and having a relationship with him and a growing relationship with him. So if you need to use that chart to understand more about how God views you and, and what you're supposed to do, even I love the part about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is with you to help you. These are areas that we have to grow in. And then the next part is, is Ryan, I don't know what spiritual growth looks like. Can you give me a picture? And that's when I wanna go through the last part of this outline. Like, I'm, I'm helping someone grow, but where do I go? Maybe we need to write that down. That's simple, but it's important. I'm helping someone grow, but where do I go? Okay? Well, the first thing is, is that we are becoming like Jesus. So we fix our eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 12, 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Colossians 2, 6 through 7, and now just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. I look at Christ and I go, let me measure my growth with Christ. Let me look at him and go, am I growing? And the next thing I'm looking at is, do I have a love for God that is grateful, that worships, prays, and learns from God's word. You can go to the next slide. These are things you're looking for in spiritual growth in your life and other people's lives. Now, of course, this doesn't include everything, but these are steps. These are mile markers and picture of what growth looks like. Do you guys follow that? This is super practical, isn't it? But I'm giving this in your outline so you can see what spiritual growth looks like in people. How about this? A sure faith in God's love and forgiveness for oneself. Do you know how many people don't really believe that Jesus loves them? So many. It's hard to grasp, isn't it? And so when we start being sure of God's love, that means you're growing. Isn't that awesome? How about this? Trusting God in difficult areas of life. Wow, that's hard. Trusting God in every area of your life is difficult in itself, right? How about a greater understanding of the Bible? The more you read it, the more you understand it. And when, you, when you're helping someone grow and you're like, wow, you're really grasping God's love. You're really grasping the story of the Bible. That's awesome. Good job. I mean, that's the kind of conversations I have with people and I help them grow. Um, conviction for what is holy to God. Turning away from old sinful habits. We already read that in 1 Peter. Obeying God and doing what is right. These are, again, just a great step of growth. How about this? A love and compassion that prays and cares for others. Isn't that a great sign of growth? A burden to help lead others to salvation and following Jesus. Sensitive and obedient to the leading of the Holy Spirit. It is cool 
when someone comes to me and goes, man, I could tell the Holy Spirit was saying, do this, and I did it, and it worked. That's awesome. Anyone ever sense that? The Holy Spirit just working in your life, and you're more aware of the Holy Spirit working in you? It's just beautiful to know, wow, I'm growing in that area. Sensitive to the reality of and wise in handling spiritual warfare. This is another level, isn't it? I mean, when you're in a situation and you realize that there's a spiritual battle going on over someone's life, or maybe you're, you're dealing with something deep, you have to go to the fact that this could really be a battle between God and the enemy, and you're in the middle, and now you're trying to figure out how to handle that, right? Well, Paul addresses this in Ephesians 6, put on the full armor of God. In other words, put on Jesus in, this, in these situations. Every day, he said, put on the full armor of God. And lastly, overall, a heart and life surrendered to be used by God for his glory and the salvation of mankind. That was, that was Paul. That was Peter. They were like, God, I give you my life to serve you. I mean, that says a lot about someone's growth, right? Now, here's the thing. Relax, okay, real quick. By the way, my wife hates it when I say relax when she's upset. <laughs> I don't mean like that. I understand. I don't show you this list so it's daunting or, or like intimidating or like, wow, I'm not there. I'm never going to be there. That's not why I show this list. I'm showing you this because this is actually what Jesus is doing inside of you. I mean, this is what Jesus started, and Scripture says he finishes what he started. If we continue to follow him, according to, according to Colossians 2, 6 through 7, we can resist and not cooperate with God and not grow. But if we remain in him, then we will bear much fruit. We will be more like Jesus. So there is this ebb and flow of this is what God's doing. Are you going to cooperate with me and, and submit to my word? And when my Holy Spirit is, is convicting or encouraging you towards something that's Jesus, will you do it or not? This is the relationship that we have with God because he doesn't force his will upon us. He's given us free will to be in a loving relationship with him. And so because of my love for God, because of his kindness, that's what Peter said, because of his kindness, do these things. That's what we're doing. We're letting God grow us. And here's the thing, that's his plan. And much more, I only gave you a few things of growth that you'll see. But this is what Jesus is up to. Isn't that neat? You know now what he's up to. And you know that you're becoming more like Christ. And so you have a picture or a, a direction and a goal to go after. Not just for your life, but the people you're loving and helping. Sound good? So don't be discouraged. Oh, man, I'm not, I have, I'm, I'm not doing any of those things. That's okay. We are growing until the day that we pass on the next life. It's a, it's a long-term relationship with Jesus, and he's gracious like that. Can we thank God for that? Amen, right? Yeah. He's yeah. gracious for that. Yeah. Wow, that was a lot that I had to say in that little bit of time. This really needs its, whole, uh, its own series. But we're doing an overview of what a, a church according to Jesus looks like, the vision that Calvary's given us. So I thank you for your patience, and I, just, I pray you can use these tools today for yourself and also for those that you're loving on. Amen? All right, let's pray. God, we thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for loving us, putting up with us, enduring with us, and even using us to help others grow. We thank you, God, for what you're doing in our hearts. We cooperate with your spirit, the refining and the healing and the altering of our hearts and minds, the renewing of our minds. God, we submit ourselves to that this week as we pray, as we read our word, as we worship you, as we live in community with others who can speak a word into our life, your word. Lord, I pray that we would grow. And God, those people that we are reaching and connecting, God, I pray we'd be bold enough and loving enough to help them grow as well. We give you all the glory and praise. And God, thank you so much again for all of our volunteers, 
all those who are serving tirelessly, sacrificing here in this building and outside in our community. We thank you for them. Bless them today as we celebrate them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week.